we have four eminent speakers, and I have the pleasure to introduce uh, them one by one shortly. So the first speaker is David Page, who is the Director of Health Policy for Canadian Hemophilia uh, Society. Uh, his principal role is to advocate for access to optimal comprehensive care uh, and the most efficacious uh, coagulation therapies in Canada. Uh, David served at the WFH Executive Committee between 2000 and 2008, and I, it was a pleasure to, to be a colleague to him during this period or later on, and uh, he was chair of the WFH uh, Coagulation Products Safety, Supply and Access Committee during 2001 to 2016. David is a patient uh, with uh, severe hemophilia B. The second presentation will be given by uh, Brian O'Mahony. He is the chief executive of the Irish Hemophilia Society, uh, president of the European Hemophilia Consortium, and former uh, WFH uh, president. He is a fellow of the Institute of Biomedical uh, Sciences uh, in UK and a fellow of the Academy of Clinical Science and Laboratory Medicine in Ireland. He is an assistant uh, adjunct professor uh, in health service management in Trinity College, Dublin. Uh, and Brian is also the author of the WFH uh, Guide to Tenders and uh, Procurement. And Brian is as well uh, a severe hemophilia B uh, patient. So we have two brilliant hemophilia B patients uh, giving us a great their great experiences. This will be followed by uh, 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 Madame Solange Sack, uh, who is the president and co-founder of the Lebanese uh, Association uh, for Hemophilia. She is the manager of the only Lebanese hemophilia treatment center and has a master's degree in social work and uh, is a professor at St. Joseph University in Lebanon. Uh, last but not least, uh, uh, Masoud Farid Malik is a person with hemophilia and a well-known community activist in uh, Pakistan. He's currently serving uh, voluntarily as a president at the Hemophilia Foundation uh, Pakistan. Uh, he has been a tireless advocate in achieving treatment for all those living with bleeding disorders in Pakistan. Today, he will be sharing uh, Pakistan experience of designing and implementing uh, virtual patient education. So with this, I finish my introductory role to the webinar and I will ask each speaker to uh, uh, pass on uh, the presentation to his uh, subsequent speaker. Next, please. Thank you very much, uh, Magdi. Um, it's really, uh, and thank you to, to the WFH for the invitation to, to speak today. It's really amazing to be talking to uh, people from really across the world. Uh, I think Masood must be about 15,000 kilometers away from where I am here in, in Canada. Um, I've been asked to talk about um, uh, why national member organizations need to educate themselves uh, and their members. Um, so I'll be focusing really on, on, on the why and perhaps some of the, the key themes in terms of what needs to be um, key themes of education. And, and my good colleague, Brian uh, Omani, will be following with much more about the, the how to do it, especially in this, in this strange age of, of uh, virtual meetings. If, if I could have the next slide, please. So I'll, I'll be talking about uh, some of the common myths, not only uh, among uh, the general public, but even among our own, uh, our own groups, our own uh, national member or organizations. Uh, then really focusing on, 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 on why national member organizations need to educate themselves and their members. And I'll finish with some uh, summary and some, some, some takeaway messages. Well, I think the first thing uh, to, to remember is, is that hemophilia is, is, is rare. It's poorly understood by almost everybody in the general public. And that's not surprising. Um, one in 10,000 people has, has hemophilia. And if we talk about some of the rare factor deficiencies and, and other rare bleeding disorders, those numbers can be as low as one in one million. So it's not surprising uh, that, that th these, these diseases are poorly understood uh, and there's really no um, reason for, for most of the general public to, uh, to know about them because they're not affected. 
uh, and we can't expect them to, to, to know. Next, please. Nevertheless, uh, there are some, some common myths that have percolated down um, into the general public. Um, uh, I think the most common, you've all come across it, that you know, if a person cuts himself, he will bleed to death. Uh, there's a myth that people with hemophilia can't lead normal lives, uh, and that's becoming less and less true. Uh, the myth that only men have bleeding disorders, and this is a problem um, across the world that, uh, that women uh, find it more difficult to get treatment for their bleeding disorder because healthcare providers say they can't have uh, a bleeding disorder. Um, there's also a myth that it's always uh, a genetic disease, that there's always a family history, and that's, that's not true either. Uh, in terms of hemophilia, um, about one third of, of cases result from a, a new mutation where there's no history in the family. And of course, the funniest of all is that uh, all of us are descended from, from Queen Victoria, who was, uh, who was a carrier. And, uh, and because of that uh, carriership, uh, uh, people with hemophilia um, were born in, in the British and the Russian and the German uh, and the Spanish royal families. Next, please. But um, it's not just in the, gen in, in the general public that, uh, that uh, hemophilia is not known. Uh, it's not well understood even by, by healthcare providers. Most doctors know nothing about it or very little. Uh, they probably spend very little time in, at, in, at, at university during their, during, during their training learning about, about hemophilia. And we've all come across people, um, uh, doctors who, 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 who perhaps know, uh, know very little and, and sometimes what they do know is, is, is not accurate. Um, Government authorities know even less, and so it is certainly our responsibility to, 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 to educate government authorities about our diseases. Um, there are a very, very, very small number of experts, um, you know, people like Magdi and, and other physicians in our, in our hemophilia treatment centers. So it really is up, uh, is, is up to us as, as, as national member organizations to, to educate healthcare providers, but we have to target our our, our, our education. We can't expect everybody to, to learn. So we need to target certain healthcare providers. And I, I would suggest that uh, these would be people in emergency departments, um, family physicians who may come across bleeding disorders and be able to refer them to, uh, to treatment centers. Um, the obstetri obstetricians and gynecologists who may come across women with, uh, with, with, with abnormal bleeding and can, can then refer them for expert care. And, and dentists who, who come across people who bleed uh, abnormally from dental procedures. And again, they can be, all these people can be uh, really important in, in referring people to, to, to the expertise. Next slide, please. Um, but these people, sh uh, many of us share, share, share myths as well. And I, I would suggest that some of these uh, um, statements uh, are no longer true or are not completely true. So many people think that recombinant factors are, are better than plasma-derived factors. And I would say that's, that's probably not the case. Uh, in many cases, plasma-derived factors are, uh, are, are, are indicated. Um, in the last 25 years, they become very, very safe. Um, we also have, I think, the idea that recombinant factors are more expensive than plasma-derived factors. And that was true uh, in the early years of recombinant factors. But in many countries now, recombinant factors uh, uh, have become much less expensive. And so we need to keep that in mind when we're talking about, about choices. Uh, we've all, we've been programmed to, I think, to, to believe that, that, that um, prophylaxis is, is more expensive than, than on-demand therapy. And I think there's been some wonderful research done in, in the Maghreb and in, in, in your part of the world uh, about low-dose prophylaxis. And, and, and that may be, uh, may, may be more cost-effective than, than on-demand therapy if we take into account um, the other costs of, you know, uh, resulting from poor care. So surgeries, hospitalization, uh, more frequent uh, consultations, and the fact that people may not be able to, to, to get an education and work if they don't have access as children to, to prophylaxis. I think we've uh, come to think that gene therapy is a, is a cure for hemophilia. And I think it really should be thought of more as, as potentially a longer lasting treatment, but not a cure. Um, we don't know how long it's going to last, and even if it does last a long time, 
the children of people with hemophilia uh, will still be will still be carriers. Girls will will, will still be carriers. And I guess the other therapy, uh, the other myth is that gene therapy is for is is for everyone, uh, and and that's not true. Uh, children are, are not eligible right now, and and even many adults will not be eligible for gene therapy, even if it is uh, uh, funded in, in a given country. Uh, next slide, please. So again, why do why do animals need to educate themselves about hemophilia? Well, I think one of the key things is is that hemophilia care needs to be provided in very specialized hemophilia treatment centers by by well trained um, uh, personnel, including physicians, nurses, physiotherapists, psychosocial workers, uh, a good blood bank. Um, I think it's important that we that we know and uh, uh, that that centers need to have enough patients to develop expertise. So we need to concentrate the care uh, in in larger centers. Uh, where where patients can come and 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 and, and staff can work full time in, in in their care. NMOs really need to support the creation and the growth of, of hemophilia treatment centers. I know in my country in Canada, it was the national member organizations uh, and our provincial chapters that were responsible for the creation of every treatment center across the country way back in the 1970s. So really, we were instrumental in in convincing governments to create these, these centers. Um, and then we have another role in terms of helping to, to, to reach out to, uh, you know, outside the, the major centers to, to find patients and, and direct them to, to the hemophilia treatment centers. Next slide, please. Another reason why we need to educate ourselves about hemophilia is that it's complicated. It's, it's not simple and it's getting more and more complicated. Um, there are many different types of bleeding disorders, not, not just hemophilia A and B. If we count the rare factor deficiencies and the different types of von Willebrand disease, um, the um, platelet function disorders, we're probably talking about 20 or 30 different kinds of, of disorders. And they all have different severities. So, you know, one size does not fit all. One treatment um, is, is not uh, what we need. And, and even within a particular disease condition, even within, for example, hemophilia A or, or, or B, um, there are many different treatments and, and different people need different treatments. Um, certainly, you know, I, I've had experience with, with different clotting factor concentrates, some of which work better than others. Nothing to do with the half-life, just the fact that, that my own particular metabolism reacts better to some, to some treatments than, than to others. Um, the other complication is that treatments are evolving rapidly. This is fantastic. Uh, uh, you know, it's really, really good news, but it makes things much more difficult and, and, and difficult for treatment centers, difficult for patients to understand all the different uh, treatments. Uh, we, we now have extended half-life factors, which act a bit differently. Uh, we have non-factor treatments like Hemlibra, which are, are revolution, revolutionizing uh, treatment. But all of this brings its own complications. And then, and then the cost of, of, of some treatments is, is decreasing rapidly. And this is very good news, but we have to, to work uh, actively to, to make, that make that happen. Next slide, please. This is a, a, a nice uh, uh, graphic from, from the European Hemophilia Consortium, which talks about the difficulties for individuals to, to make decisions about their treatments. Uh, and, and this particular young man um, is, is is communicating all the different issues for for people in terms of their own needs, their own their own uh, their own desires, their own their own goals, uh, their own situations, and 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 all of those those factors enter into into decisions about about choosing uh, the best option in, in in terms of treatment. Next slide, please. Um, in terms of, uh, of, of our organizations, our collective organizations, we also need to be educated because we have a role to play in terms of, uh, of making sure that uh, the, the greatest number of products in the greatest volumes are, 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 are available in our countries uh, and that we can make, make these products accessible to, 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 to patients. So treatments, uh, you know, hemophilia treatment is very expensive uh, and so we need to, to carefully choose um, uh, treatments so that we have the the best treatments but also the, the, the biggest volumes of treatments and and, and research by in, in Europe has shown that uh, when physicians and patients are involved in the selection of treatments um, not only do you get a, a better selection but you also get reduced costs 
And there are ways for national hemophilia organizations to be involved uh, in, 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 the, in that selection. So certainly uh, we, we need to push for competitive tenders for products where products compete against each other uh, and, and, and lower prices. We need to, to push for low dose prophylaxis, especially for children, um, because it can make a huge difference in their lives. Um, we need to cut out the middleman um, or middlemen. There could be uh, many people in the, in, in, uh, who are between the, the manufacturer uh, and the, the actual distributor of, of products in, to, to hospitals. The more middlemen you have, the higher the cost. And, and, and this can even lead in some cases to corruption. Um, one suggestion is to buy in large volumes uh, so as, as to, to, to guarantee uh, supply and, and to reduce prices. And one way to do that is to have uh, longer, not one year contracts, but two or three year contracts. Uh, next slide. So what are the kinds of things uh, that, that are really important for families uh, to understand? Well, certainly, uh, you know, these are the main, the main categories. How, how many hemophilia is transmitted? People need to understand uh, the genetics of, of hemophilia, how to prevent bleeds in the first place. And this, this involves um, uh, talking to, to families about, about, about activities. The importance of treating bleeds quickly when they occur, when they occur, where to get treatment, how to stay active and fit, training, training families in, in terms of doing prophylactic treatments. Um, and, and, and the special importance of education for, for children with hemophilia. And, and finally, when, we, when it comes down to selecting products, uh, they're all different and they all have risks and benefits. And so th those need to be known. And finally, I think this is my, my last and my summary slide. So the, the key takeaway messages from, from my talk are that NMOs need to know the advantages and disadvantages of different treatments so they can, they can inform patients. NMOs need to be involved in the selection of treatment products to get the best choice and the highest quantity at the best price. NMOs need to support the creation and development of hemophilia treatment centers where there will, there will be expertise and people can get the best treatment. And finally, NMOs need to educate their members so they can make smart choices about, about their health. So that's really the, the why and a, and a bit of the what. Uh, and, uh, but I'll move on to uh, to, my, to the next speaker, who is Brian Omani. Many of you uh, know Brian from his days uh, 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 with, with WFH, uh, and he's gonna talk to you more about, about, about how to educate people. So take it away, Brian. First part of communication, it helps if I unmute. You can hear me? Okay. Yes, we. Good afternoon, good evening, bonsoir, assalamu alaikum. Nice to see such a large attendance at the webinar. So I want to follow David's talk by talking about effective uh, patient and education in a changing world. And I'm really going to talk about patient education as opposed to public education. Uh, David. Mentioned earlier that the general public know that they don't need to know very much about hemophilia. The, the families with hemophilia, the person with hemophilia, and the medical teams and the, the government health officials need to understand hemophilia. But the, the general public really don't need to have any great understanding. And I worry sometimes that hemophilia patient organizations spend too much time trying to educate the public, which is a very big ask. So, next slide, please. So hemophilia is a lifelong condition. So the person with hemophilia or the parent must understand the condition to allow you to be an advocate for yourself or for your child and to navigate what is a lifelong condition. Otherwise, at some point, you are going to run up against somebody in the system who doesn't understand hemophilia and they won't listen to you. So it's important to understand the condition. Um, and I think, you know, it, we talk about treatment and generations of treatment and novel treatments, but education really is, is a really good treatment for hemophilia because without education, you cannot understand your options. And the standard methods of education that we've been using for years include publications, 
conferences and events, websites, social media, and more recently, podcasts. Next slide, please. But I, I think in, in the last couple of months uh, with COVID-19, uh, we've seen some dramatic changes. We've seen the surge in the use of telemedicine, um, where and you're seeing virtual consultations either by phone or video or other platforms. And I think this is leading to, I think, a, a strong conclusion that the future may be a blend of virtual and actual visits. Uh, and global telemedicine market is anticipated to grow at almost 15% per annum. Uh, and young people, of course, consume information in a different way. We talk about publications and hard copies. They look at, uh, they don't even look at emails. Uh, they look at smartphones, social media, and, and various social media channels. Next slide, please. Now, in, in Ireland, since the start of COVID-19, um, we have worked very closely, collaboratively, with our network of treatment centres to introduce telemedicine, virtual consultations. Uh, and we've, we've actually just uh, had a paper accepted for publication with the centres, looking at the outcome of that. And I think it makes interesting reading. If you look at, if you look at the, uh, the, the amount of medical consultation activity in March when COVID hit, compared to uh, 2019 in blue, the, the activity went way down. But by April it had come back up, and by May there was actually more consultation than in the previous year. If you look at the, um, the physiotherapy activity, which you might think it's difficult to do that virtually, not the case. A lot of virtual physiotherapy activity, including gym and exercise classes, uh, carried on during the pandemic. And in, indeed, again, the amount of activity increased compared to last year. Uh, interestingly, one thing that decreased was the proportion of people who did not attend. So typically in the past, anything up to 15% of people would have missed clinic appointments. Uh, since the pandemic, it has dropped to about 4 to 6%. Um, because people are ge generally, they're at home and you schedule the appointment by phone or by video. And also when, when a survey was carried out among the healthcare workers in relation to their view of the, uh, the use of telemedicine, they were very happy with this. They were confident with the, the consultation. They found it easy to communicate. They would recommend this. Um, the, only, the only downside, the only area where it really didn't work is if the visit requires phlebotomy or blood sampling. So obviously you can't do that virtually. But it's, I certainly think that it's been a major success. We've all been talking about telemedicine for a number of years. We had introduced it for mild hemophilia prior to the pandemic, but we have been pleasantly surprised by how well it has worked in the last few months. Next slide, please. So in terms of new approaches to technology, 25% uh, of the US population are millennials and 98% of them own a smartphone and a very large proportion of uh, people in the world own smartphones. I, I saw recently that um, South Korea is one of the most technologically advanced countries in the world, but the proportion of population who own smartphones in South Korea is matched by the proportion of the population who own smartphones in Lebanon. So I think smartphone use has, is, is global, um, and I think that the way that people shop, they schedule appointments, they read reviews is now uh, it's different. It's entirely different than the standard or traditional methods. Next slide, please. So I think in, in looking at new approaches to education, we must follow the same trends, not just because of COVID-19, but because of the, the impact of technology. Uh, and I think uh, technology now is readily available at home. Smartphones, PCs, tablets are readily available. And if you look at, <coughs> if you look at uh, virtual consultations, you look at educational materials, people now want to, to be able to uh, educate themselves at home using their technology with no requirement of travel. And people with haemophilia will want the information sent to them digitally. This is time and resource efficient. Next slide, please. So I think in the last few months, Again, um, we've been looking, as I'm sure many of the societies have over the last several years, seeing to what extent we could move away 
to from hard copy publications to digital publications. Um, and in fact, this has been this has been greatly assisted in fact by the pandemic because the number of members who will who will now read our publication digitally has more than doubled. So we, we've produced a lot of publications this year, for example, but they're all being produced digitally with a, a page turning reader on the website. But all, we we only produce some of them now in hard copy. Our conferences and events have been virtual by Zoom using Microsoft Teams or Zoom or other platforms. And these have been very, very successful. Uh, our website is unchanged, but updated more frequently. And social media, when you look at how the younger generation consume education, um, a lot of them won't use Facebook. They regard Facebook now as being for old people. Okay, they'll use Twitter, Instagram, Snapchat, TikTok. Uh, and I think these, these are you know, remarkable mediums for getting information across. Podcasts and webinars. YouTube channels. These are all, these have all come into play more since COVID-19 and I think we need to start moving a lot of our educational efforts uh, towards those areas. Next slide please. It, it, our own education strategy, you know, we're producing more digital publications. We have a weekly electronic magazine. The other thing that's happened in the last couple of years and has been exacerbated by the pandemic is people don't want to wait for information. So you know, a magazine that you might produce every quarter is very nice, very good, but people want information very, very quickly. They want to be updated. So we're now producing a weekly electronic short um, magazine. Um, we've had a significant number of people now, take, now reading that and going on our electronic mailing list. Um, we have not been able to do home visits to members uh, to educate them, to help new families, but we have made... Um, over 1,200 phone calls at this point to members. So we, we reach out to members on the phone, we check how they're doing, and we see if they need education materials or any help or support. Uh, I think what's been remarkably successful from our point of view are the, the Zoom webinars. Um, uh, typically, we would have run 12 conferences every year, two large conferences, a, a lot of smaller information meetings. This year, obviously, after March, it's all virtual. We've, we've had 28 Zoom meetings uh, this year. They've been well attended um, to attend with minimum time commitment. So that's only one hour. So they're not taking a whole day to travel. Uh, they just need the, the technology. They need, to, they need obviously the, 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 the broadband or the Wi-Fi. And then they can, they can join the Zoom meeting for a topic they're interested in. If they can't join at that time, uh, we also record the, uh, the sessions and we post them on our website and they can click on and follow them on YouTube. So again, people, and if you're looking at areas like novel therapies, which are getting more and more complex, um, and we're producing, uh, along with EHC, very nice information materials on this, but the written materials are complex. It's very, very good to have good communicators actually explaining these to people. That's much easier to do by Zoom than it is in a publication. Podcasts are, are becoming more popular. We've even had virtual exercise in gymnasium class, gym classes with, um, with a group of physiotherapists for people with hemophilia. And these, these have been very popular. Next slide, please. So these are, this is an example of some of the weekly e-zines. Next slide. And, and some of the webinars. And again, most of the webinars are posted on the website afterwards um, uh, and they can watch them on YouTube. We are careful to protect people's identity. So we, we record the webinar, but we filter out the attendees and we usually filter out the question and answer sessions and just put up the speaker with their lecture. The other big advantage of this, of course, is this opens up the world uh, in a very cost-effective way. We've had David Page doing a talk for us uh, on one of our Zoom meetings. Now, uh, David has been to Ireland several times, but you know it's expensive and time-consuming for David to come over to Ireland and go back. So we can now all access speakers from around the world for our events like this. And I would encourage you to, to think about this. So if you're, if you're doing virtual meetings in future, don't just limit yourself to perhaps the clinician or the person locally or the hemophilia society. You can look, uh, be more ambitious in, in seeking speakers from abroad. And I think this is something that, that certainly the availability of, of this technology has, has greatly assisted. Next slide, please. 
social media has, has changed. Uh, I, I mentioned TikTok. We're actually rolling out an entire campaign on TikTok uh, targeted at teenage girls with menorrhagia because uh, that will get a much higher proportion of the teenage girls in our country so than, than any traditional media. So you also need to understand the media in your country and what's the best way to reach groups of people in your demographic. Next slide. Next slide, please. So this is a blend of old and new. So after the WPH Congress every two years, um, no, go back please to the previous one. Go back. Okay, thank you. Um, after the WPH Congress, the Irish Hemophilia Society produced a report uh, every two years on the Congress where, where every one of our board or staff or volunteers who attend does a report on the sessions they listen to. And we did that, that, that this year. We did it, um, a virtual digital copy but, but interestingly enough, my, my own report in this instance was based on my tweets during the conference, not on a traditional written report. So a mixture, this is a mixture as well. So you're blending social media with the, with the old school publications. Next slide. Next slide, please. So I think that the future of education, I think in a sense, the future of education in haemophilia is going to be similar to the future of comprehensive care. I, I think that we will, in many countries, we'll see a mix be, of virtual and actual events, uh, as well as in centres, virtual and actual consultations. Uh, certainly, I think we'll be looking at a smaller number of conferences supplemented by regular webinars. When the pandemic is over, hopefully it's over, we will, we will not stop doing Zoom meetings. Uh, more and more will be digital with flipbook capability on the website. Uh, and an interesting example is there was a recent ISA report from the USA, an economics report um, on, on comparing factor eight with gene therapy with emicizumab. And there's an EHC uh, economics conference on this week and next week. And this was a pre-read material, but it's 123 pages. And we, we realized people won't read a 123 page economic report unless they've got insomnia. So what, what we actually prepared was a, a, a slide summary and a podcast, and they were sent out as the pre-read because we recognize you have to deliver the information in a way that people will actually consume it. So education campaigns can be run on social media. Uh, you can develop patient portals where you interact with the centers and patients digitally. And I think through these portals as well, you can actually push information directly out to specific groups of patients using uh, logarithms, or, or they can pull information from the, the menu that's there. Next slide, please. So I think the advantages of that kind of approach, time efficient, less travel, uh, cost efficient, you'll have lower printing and packaging costs. Uh, you can broaden your access to international speakers at no additional cost. You're providing information relevant to the new methods of consumption. The disadvantages, I think many of us will be, will be unable to entirely stop doing hard copy publications uh, in parallel for some members at least, because some of the older members especially still like to get hard copy publications. And the problem is of course, a print run is a print run. So if we reduce our requirement from a thousand uh, newsletters to 200, it saves very little money. So you still have that cost until you can actually go entirely digital. There is, as we go more and more virtual with, with education and meetings, there is the, loss of, the risk of the loss of personal contact. And you also risk losing some elements of community building. And I think many of us who've been at many Zoom meetings and conferences over the, the past um, couple of months, and indeed, can you imagine if, if the 68 people on this call with the speakers were together this afternoon in a room, and afterwards we could stand together and have coffee and a conversation. You're losing that element of community building and informal exchange of information. And also, of course, it does assume good internet access, uh, and, but that also means you must have smartphone friendly website content that won't consume a person's entire mobile data allowance uh, with one short piece of information. Next slide, please. So that's the end of my presentation, thank you. And now I'll pass on to Solange. Solange, the floor is yours.
all i am very happy to be meeting with you we all of us constituting the big family of hemophilia i hope that everyone is very well protected from covid 19. good luck to all of us and i wish everyone courage and for good protection the following slide please in order to present uh, the different educational programs targeting the patients and their families we shall see in this presentation the mission of the lebanese association of hemophilia and the types of patients education the medical education sessions and the physiotherapy education sessions and the session for parents education and sessions for parental guidance regarding problems of school integration sessions of professional orientation for children and young adults and then lastly the challenges of the educational action as well as the challenges faced during the period of COVID-19. I myself have established the association in 1992, the Lebanese Association of Hemophilia, with the parents and doctors. We aim to improve the medical, social, educational, and professional situation of people with hemophilia and to render them partners in the management and administration of their disease. In the year 2000, we have created the Center for the Treatment of Hemophilia Arch that provides uh, the global services of comprehensive care. And then in 2002, we have expanded uh, the actions of this association for patients that have all types of bleeding disorders and hereditary diseases. In terms of uh, types of education of patients, we have two types, either the personal education that we provide during the visits to the center, that would be the one-to-one, -one, or during the educational follow-up throughout the telephone calls and that are quite numerous. So the patients that call the association or the sessions for group education and these groups uh, are formed based on the age categories or the different themes or oh, could be medical themes physiotherapy social or professional themes and these themes are linked to the mission of the association regarding the sessions of medical education they particularly target providing knowledge about the disease, the causes of bleedings, the measures to be taken or during the apparition of any bleedings and the transmission and genetic advices. And these are targeted to the patients and their parents. There are also sessions regarding the different types of treatment on demand for protection and the pro associated protocols on prevention and there is some work that is done also for teaching or training regarding the self-injection in order to provide the home treatment which is our objective there are also some sessions that relate to the complications of the disease whether we're talking of the hemophilia or other types of bleeding disorders these are the arthropathies the nervous compressions following the different muscular issues and then the appearance of inhibitors as well as the dental problems the following slide please regarding the sessions of physiotherapy education following the assumption of the physiotherapy treatment in our center uh, the specialist of hemophilia that most of you know mr cesar haddad has elaborated an individual program for physiotherapy exercises at home and he follows the patient by phone and they themselves they contact him we also organize certain physical education sessions in groups whether at the our association or in the different sports center for like aqua gym and we do aerobic exercises and certain exercises for muscular 
maintenance. Regarding the educational sessions for parents, these sessions aim to develop the family support for the purpose of informing the families of the factors of psychosocial risks to which the children are exposed whether at the personal level of the children or at the level of the family or at the level of their social groups. We also encourage the families to develop the different factors of protections that are necessary to assist the children in their relation and in their social integration. And this also uh, is related to the factors of resistance and of strength for these uh, children at the individual level and at the level of their families and at the level of their communities. And an example to that is that a day was held for 72 parents where many cases were presented and there was an exchange of information in six groups that were moderated by members of the association and by social workers. The following slide, please. The sessions of parental guidance regarding the problems of integration into schools. These sessions aim at preparing the parents to deal with some school problems associated to the fact that the children have hemophilia. So in one of the groups, we have passed around a questionnaire related to the specific problems of each child in his school. In addition to that, there has been an exchange of possible solutions, uh, solutions in four groups uh, of 60 persons. In addition to that, we were aiming to revitalize the parents, to uh, enhance their solidarity and their self-esteem through the sessions we have provided for laughter yoga for anti-stress. Regarding uh, the sessions of professional orientation for children and young adults, we provide this for the purpose of educating the patients in order to discover their professional potentials, also to orient the young people towards discovering the requirements of the labor world and to prepare them for their professional integration. We have resorted to certain um, people from NGOs uh, that uh, prepare the people with special needs in order to integrate uh, the labor market. And in all of our educational activities by groups, we always seek to have uh, people assisting us from outside our team in order to diversify the different relations and visions. The following slide, please. The challenges of the educational action. The first challenge is the decline of the interest of patients following their increased access to the factors of treatment. And this is something that we face, especially with the patients uh, that are covered, that or whose treatment is covered uh, by the social security uh, fund, because Due to this system, uh, the patients can obtain the whole quantity for prevention and treatment, so they no longer need to resort to our association. The second challenge is the uh, fact that certain families refuse to participate due to the stigma that is associated to hemophilia. They do not want their children to be associated uh, to this disease or to people with hemophilia. The third challenge is the necessity of integrating some recreational activities in order to stimulate the motivation of patients. And another challenge is the requirement to ensure the financial coverage of these activities and the cost of transport due to the defective financial situation of patients. We also have faced the risk of change of the location or the, of the, the different timing of our educational programs due to the security problems that we are facing in Lebanon. The challenges faced in the period of COVID-19. Uh, first of all, like everyone, 
it was impossible for us to organize some uh, group sessions. On the other hand, we faced difficulties and we had certain constraints regarding the online sessions. Due to the limited technical means, the different uh, electricity outages and the weak internet connection, the high cost of internet services, and the difficulties of using the different logistics according or depending on the limited education level of the patients. In conclusion, I would like to um, emphasize the fact that educating the patients would uh, require a lot of patience and uh, perseverance activity from the leaders of the associations. Also, the importance of education strengthen the feeling of belonging of patients to the associations. On the other hand, the education also enables the patients to self-manage their state of hemophilia. And finally, the education prepare the patients to the role of advocacy in order to sensitize the community towards the issue of hemophilia and the bleeding hereditary diseases and to their needs. Thank you, everyone. Thank you all for your attention and for your follow-up. Thank you. I will give the floor now to Masoud. Masoud, you have the floor. Thank you. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Uh, <coughs> thank you, Dr. Magdi, for the detailed introduction. And uh, thank you, Solange, for handing over mic to me. Uh, well, I'm asked to, um, today I'm asked uh, uh, to share the Pakistan experience of designing and implementing the virtual education program. Um, it was, uh, well, every country has a different um, experience and uh, uh, it was very much challenging uh, uh, from an from a, from a emerging uh, country or emerging NMO um, to develop something like that. Uh, but still, we tried our best uh, to use and adopt some um, uh, uh, virtual initiatives uh, in order to improve, or you can say that, uh, um, continue our patient education program. Uh, please, next. So, well, um, today I'll uh, try to focus on three main areas. Uh, first, I will uh, try to um, highlight the challenges faced by Hemophilia Foundation Pakistan uh, um, regarding their... Um, uh, um, community outreach uh, during COVID-19 scenario. Uh, secondly, I'll uh, try to explain that how Hemophilia Foundation Pakistan responded to the community needs um, and how and what kind of um, innovative and adaptable virtual initiatives uh, we have adopted uh, to reach out the community. Uh, third, I'll try to explain um, uh, what kind of lesson we have learned and the impact of uh, using those um, uh, uh, adaptable virtual uh, initiatives uh, in our education program. Please, next. Well, we all know that um, uh, <clears throat> the COVID-19 uh, scenario was um, started, or you can say that, pop up somewhere in December, but uh, March was the time that when we can say that it was a, a, a peak and a hype of this um, uh, global pandemic. And this was the same time that when um, it was also uh, hit badly uh, to um, our region and especially to Pakistan. And at that time, everybody was in panic. And uh, the main challenge um, uh, we faced that how we can ensure the safety of our staff, because whatever program or initiative um, we were discussing, um, the main role of staff uh, was to deliver those things. And it was not easy uh, for all chapters um, to first decide that how they can ensure the safety of their staff. After that, um, uh, the other challenge um, we have faced about that, um, uh, it was the difficult decision that what kind of virtual medium we should adopt um, uh, considering the wider use of that medium. Uh, medium. So um, uh, the chapters and uh, Hemophilia Foundation Pakistan, um, we all work together that um, how we can reach out to the community by using a medium that is widely used and accessible uh, to the masses. Um, the other challenge we face that um, sometimes using those uh, decided mediums, 
become difficult when we say that okay we have to convey our message in the local language uh, so uh, uh, it was another ch challenge because um, uh, much of the material that was there available online that was in english or in different languages uh, so it was another challenge uh, for us and the other thing we we noticed um, that um, we have finalized few ideas that how we can continue the patient education and community outreach but we got stuck when we discussed that how we have to evaluate that the impact of our newly designed in, uh, initiatives uh, so these are like main core um, you can say that um, challenges we have seen in, in in all the planning phase is next so how we responded and what kind of uh, um, initiatives we have uh, designed um, well uh, we realized that um, country like pakistan most of the people have um, um, mobile phones uh, some of them have smartphones and some of them uh, usually carry the old uh, traditional um, cell phones without internet sometimes so uh, we thought that like the only thing which we can do is to send them short messages the sms and for that uh, we requested uh, uh, to the pakistan telecommunication authority and we got a branded name and we started sending our messages and uh, educational um, material or uh, covid uh, awareness related um, messages um, by using that service and uh, the message usually goes uh, to the community uh, with hfp instead of sending it from a number we use this masking uh, so that if they receive any uh, any message they can quickly recognize that okay this is from the hemophilia uh, found uh, foundation pakistan uh, we also used um, um, whatsapp uh, uh, for uh, sharing the or disseminating the educational videos to most of the community members those have smartphones with internet we also used uh, some educational uh, sessions by using uh, skype zoom and other Uh, um, uh, virtual channels uh, we have some um, scheduled uh, meeting uh, meetings for the for the next month um, we also did a small pilot you can say that um, um, uh, experiment and for that we used in one of our chapter we used the local telephone line uh, as as a tool free helpline because we can't expect people to uh, uh, call us and pay um, uh, the bill for that uh, call because um, we have we noticed that the frequency of calls from the community was going up so uh, just for for the for the for the pilot initiative what we did um, we requested the um, service provider and uh, tell them that uh, do they have any kind of facility that the caller should not be the one who is paying for the for the for the for the call charges and it should be charged to the Uh, to the to the to the um, receiver and we did a pilot project and uh, we realized that uh, it also helped the community and the um, uh, the chart we were maintaining the calls number of calls per day increased uh, because the p it was convenient for people not paying and contacting the um, um, uh, treatment center uh, for their um, uh, um, you can have questions and for guidance next please okay the lessons we learned um uh with this uh, you can say that a whole um uh, shifting from from physical to uh, virtual uh, educational program uh, we realized that hemophilia foundation pakistan stayed connected with our community while maintaining the um, social distance and we also realized that uh, the engagement of community was high because it's very easy or handy uh, for for someone um, to attend like 20 minutes 15 minutes session uh, by using their uh, their their um, uh, cell phone um, somebody uh, we have seen people uh, attending those sessions from their offices from their homes from from the, from, from the places where they uh, they are at that time and uh, we also noticed that um, the attention level increased because uh, it's convenient for them to just spare like few minutes or uh, some time and attend that meeting or attend that session uh, we also realized that it's a cost effective and the impact was very high 
um, uh, because um, uh, people, uh, we have seen that uh, when we compared that how many people uh, uh, attended our uh, sessions in like 2019 and when we compared it with our virtual uh, 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 data we received uh, the numbers were high so um, these were the you can say the, uh, the, the the main lessons we have learned from from our switching from uh, now one one platform to other platform please next Well, every program has um, uh, some pros and cons. Um, um, there's no doubt that virtual outreach is the need of an hour. And these programs um, save our time and cost as well as mentioned by, by Brian. Um, and, and it's very easy to reach the, uh, the wider uh, um, audience by using those uh, virtual mediums. And it depends that what kind of medium we, we, we are using, but mostly uh, it's easy to reach out the wider community, uh, especially in those areas where, where we have internet facilities. Um, uh, with regards to the con, there is no doubt the value of physical interaction will always remain. Uh, because uh, for example, um, if we have to do um, 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 uh, a kind of, you can say that, one-to-one um, uh, -one session or um, uh, psychological sessions um, or guidance sessions, uh, the human element matters a lot. So we can't do uh, some sessions virtually. Um, uh, we have also noticed that uh, not everyone is fully equipped to use those, um, uh, those uh, virtual sessions as already mentioned by uh, my good friend Brian that um, uh, uh, the older um, community members, they prefer to have physical meetings, they prefer to have hard copies of the magazines or newsletters. So uh, the young generation are very much into these um, uh, virtual um, things. Um, the other thing we notice that uh, sometimes we also notice that like the, it's not easy to oh, evaluate the actual impact and it becomes a challenge. Uh, yes, for, for few sessions, it's easy, but how much the quantitative, like the numbers, we is it's easy that how many people have attended, but how much they have learned from those sessions, um, it's, it's a challenge to, to do the evaluation, I believe. Um, next, please. Well, uh, that's all from my side. Um, over to you, Magadhi. Uh Thank you very much. Thank you, Masoud, and thank you to uh, uh, all the four speakers. Uh, it has been, uh, I think, a wonderful presentation, full of information, and I hope that all the audience uh, have enjoyed this uh, and uh, had uh, some, uh, uh, I mean, useful information for how to move forward during the current situations. So before I uh, go into the question and answer session, I would like to uh, uh, announce that uh, the WFH uh, resources have an e-learning uh, center which has a lot of uh, uh, important and interesting topics like uh, some uh, knowledge about inherited bleeding disorders, introduction to Rumifulia Nova therapies and others. So I would uh, uh, strongly recommend that you visit the e-learning center at the uh, uh, website of the WFH through the WFH resources. Uh, and uh, I mean, navigate through this, I, I'm sure you will have uh, very important information that can be helpful to you. Uh, next slide, please. The other thing is that WFH, uh, uh, Media Patient Organization, to go to a website uh, uh, tool to, for self-assessment. Uh, uh, and this will uh, allow the uh, NMOs to uh, self-evaluate themselves regarding the different uh, aspects of their activities. Uh, so please visit this as well and try to uh, uh, assess uh, your uh, organization and uh, what is, uh, are the points that you have to do in order to improve uh, your current situation. And probably it would be nice to share this with uh, Rana uh, if uh, this will uh, help you to discuss uh, different aspects on how to self-assess and uh, improve the situation. 
So with this, uh, uh, we come to the question and answer uh, session. Uh, uh, we had, uh, I mean, we had one uh, uh, question sent to uh, Rana and myself or, or to, uh, from uh, uh, a colleague in Syria. Uh, his name is Mohammed Ahmed al Abush, And we all know that uh, Syria is passing through a very difficult period of time. Uh, so uh, Rana and myself will later address the Syrian Hemophilia Society uh, about uh, the issues raised and uh, steps to be taken uh, to improve the situation. There were uh, three questions that have been answered by Brian, but I would uh, like also to, to ask Brian if he can be again uh, emphasize uh, or answer to these questions uh, uh, about the uh, cost of recombinant versus plasma drive concentrates and the importance of, uh, I mean, uh, whether uh, follow only virtual uh, 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 way of education or, uh, or blending them. So Brian, can you, uh, can you answer to these two questions, please? Sure. Uh, on the first one, and David mentioned this in his talk, that, that it was always assumed that recombinant factor concentrates were more expensive. And that was indeed the case from 1994 until about 2015. In the vast majority of countries, recombinant products were significantly more expensive than plasma-derived concentrates. Um, and um, in, in fact, when we surveyed all of the European countries in 2015, we found a seven-fold difference in the price between plasma-derived concentrates and a four-fold difference with recombinant. And the, the, the mean and median prices for recombinant were significantly higher. Now, what's happened since 2015 is a definitely a narrowing of that difference. Um, first of all, increased competition, national tenders of procurement where the amount that you purchase Us, but also, I think, uh, probably more importantly, the availability on the market of extended half-life factor concentrates put downward pressure on the price of recombinant factor concentrates in many countries. So, uh, you know, companies had to lower their prices to compete. And then as more EHL factor concentrates came on the market, they competed with each other, the prices of the EHL started to fall. Now with emicizumab on the market, uh, you'll see that downward price on EHL. So I think one of the I suppose, unsung benefits of all of the novel therapies that are coming on the market and all the new treatments is that it does mean that you have a better possibility of getting access to the uh, standard treatments of the earlier generations of treatments at a lower cost. Um, that, that, that's, uh, that, that's my view on that. In terms of virtual versus um, uh, real life events, um, I, I, think, I think we're all going to have to look at this country to country into the future. But I certainly think that the pandemic has, has accelerated the trend towards doing virtual events, has accelerated the trend towards doing digital publications, has made it more difficult to do in-person meetings. Now, we clearly all want to get back to in-person meetings. Uh, but I think we'll have to be more judicious about which ones we do, how often we do them, looking at the... The, the, the size of the country, it's very easy to do in-person meetings in Ireland. It's a small country. If you're talking about Canada or Pakistan, it, these are enormous countries. So it's entirely different. Uh, so I think we'll have to look at it very carefully. And I think many of us in the future will look at a blend of maybe less in-person meetings or events with more virtual uh, webinars or meetings like this. Uh, and also uh, certainly a move away from just doing hard copy publications to doing more digital publications and more use of social media. And I think a perfect example is what Masood said about Pakistan. Uh, you know, we, we, will use, we will use a lot of uh, high-end content on YouTube and so on because people in Ireland have very good broadband. But if, if a lot of people in Pakistan have mobile phones, but a lot of them don't have smartphones, then SMS is a perfect way to go or WhatsApp. So you have to, you also have to tailor the approach you take to the infrastructure and the requirements and the geography of, the, of each country. Perhaps I can add a few words on the cost of, of recombinant. Um, you know, I think it's, it's normal that recombinant is becoming cheaper than, than plasma derived uh, factor eight, nine. Um, you know, first of all, the, the production of recombinant is much higher now than, than plasma derived. Um, 
uh, it's a mature technology and, and, and the price of production of recombinant, especially the, the standard half-life, which has been around for 20, 25 years, has fallen to, you know, to several cents per unit. And so I think if, if national member organizations can convince their governments to, to buy in, in enough quantity and uh, in, a, in a competitive way, uh, you'll see prices uh, for recombinant falling below plasma-derived uh, uh, across the world. Remember, for plasma-derived, you, you have to pay for the plasma, you have to fractionate the plasma. It's a very complicated process. A lot more safety measures have to be put in place. So it's normal that recombinant should become cheaper and cheaper. Thank you, David. Thank you, Brian. We still have uh, some questions. So one question asks if the, uh, the WHO would have or encourages to have a page on the Instagram because this will facilitate transfer of the news and uh, uh, others. So this is Rana, you may take note of this and see if uh, this can happen with the, uh, uh, I mean, uh, communication. Uh. We will uh, discuss uh, the question with the WFH communications department who are in charge and responsible for all our means of communication. So we will pass on this suggestion to them and uh, hopefully they will be able to consider uh, the feasibility of uh, this suggestion and if they deem it uh, possible they will uh, take forward action on it. Thank you. Okay. Can I just say as well, Maggie, that uh, we use Instagram and Twitter quite a lot now for communication as well, that they're good communication channels. Thank you. So uh, another question is uh, uh, if, I mean, uh, if there was uh, uh, an impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on the humanitarian aid program of the WFH. Uh, I'm not sure if Assad is joining us to, to answer this question. No. To my knowledge, uh, I would say uh, from... Yes. I don't think he's with us today, but we can uh, answer that question offline. Uh, specifically for this country. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and then uh, from Cesar, uh, a question about, I mean, how can we progress on the region? Uh, because uh, there is under registration and uh, some countries are without re reporting figures yet. So, uh, I mean, I think uh, this is also something that we, we need to work on with the NMOs in the different countries. Do you have any comment, Rana, from your communication with the uh, NMOs in the region about the annual global survey and their contribution? I think we have at least 12 to 15 countries out of 22 reporting. Hello? Yes, Can Rana. Yes, so um, I think, uh, yes, we have just concluded a uh, full survey of all NMOs across the world. The results of that survey are currently under analysis. And once uh, we have those summarized, we will be able to better uh, address the question about future strategies. Yeah. So uh, again, the last question, uh, I mean, as a question from Mr. Hamoud al Abush, and I said that we will answer this and try to help him with his problem uh, uh, through communication with the Syrian uh, Hemophilia Society. We have two uh, medical questions about one boy who has uh, uh, inhibitors uh, for five years and uh, is suffering from repeated bleeding, although he tried to use the uh, factor and rotexumab. I think this is a, a medical question. I mean, if he is experiencing a lot of bleeds and he has in his country the hem libra, this may be a different uh, management tool that can be better than using the concentrates. If they have the other bypassing agents, this is also something that probably right now you can communicate and see what is available in the country and uh, the hematologists are in the country that can help him. Then there was a medical question also from uh, Addis Ababa uh, about uh, the different aspects. I mean, 
they say that he says that the humanitarian aid has helped a lot uh, uh, to treat patients in hemophilia in uh, Ethiopia, but how they can progress this into the prophylaxis, at least the low dose prophylaxis, so that uh, this can uh, save the children uh, from uh, the complications of uh, hemophilia to prevent the permanent damage. And uh, also he's asking about other medications like Himlebra, the antifibrinolytics of the desmopressin. I think we need to communicate with the medical persons in the uh, uh, in Ethiopia uh, to try to help him to further and maybe Assad also uh, would uh, communicate and if they need more products uh, from the humanitarian aid to help this. Uh, we have also a question I think from Sudan. Can you handle this later on uh, uh, Rana? You see this question, something about uh, communication with Dr. Maria and the Sudanese Hemophilia Society. He, yes, I've seen um, this and uh, I think they have some uh, communications difficulties because of the difficult situation that they had in, uh, in Sudan. Uh, but yes, we, can, uh, we would be more than happy to organize a meeting in any country between the um, healthcare professionals and the patients to discuss specific issues related to, to that particular country. It would be our pleasure to uh, call for a meeting to discuss any any issues of that nature. Thank you. Can I make a comment as well, just about the use of, of virtual meetings? I mean, I think this is a very good webinar. It's it's worthwhile looking reflecting on the fact that the WFH virtual summit this year had the biggest attendance ever at any WFH Congress. I think about eight thousand individual visits or visitors. Uh, and, and also, I'm, I'm thinking of the fact that last year I had the pleasure of visiting Pakistan and working with Masood and his colleagues there. But then Masood and Rana and I were able to take that walk forward together by Zoom. Uh, in a, and th I think in a much more beneficial way in the last few months than we would have been just using conference calls. So I'm, I'm a big fan of, of um, Zoom or, or Microsoft Teams where you can actually see people, you can have a better conversation than you can on a conference call, which tend to be a little bit impersonal sometimes. Yeah, thank you, Brian. There is another question from Murad from Pakistan. Uh, he's asking why are some countries delaying national register as it is very important and the number of patients can be limited and work to find appropriate medical care for them. Yeah, I think this is a challenge and I, I think we, we had some discussion regarding the Moroccan situation, you remember, Rana, on how to build a national registry and how to, I mean, because, I mean, the big challenge is to have uh, a collaboration uh, inside the country to collect the data and uh, that all the parties will agree on uh, uh, working together to have the data and then to, to share this data, which is very, very important for advocacy, uh, uh, for improving the care uh, so probably, Rana, if we can organize in the future uh, a special uh, webinar on how to have uh, build a national registry and uh, with the aid of, I mean, probably if David and Brian would, would like to share in this uh, with their experiences. And you remember, uh, David, you gave us insight in the Cairo meeting uh, from the experience in Canada. So if we can organize such a thing to improve the... Uh, situation regarding the National Registry and uh, together with the help of Cesar from his experience uh, also in, uh, in Latin America, that will be wonderful. National Registries are, are, are very important, but they're also very difficult and, and expensive to develop. So another alternative is to, is to associate with the World Bleeding Disorder Registry, which is being, being uh, led by the World Federation of Hemophilia. That might be a much faster and and, and, and more effective way of, of uh, collecting this information. Yeah, thank you. Yes, please, Rana. Um, that's precisely right. We are uh, doing a lot of um, uh, sessions to explain uh, how people can join the World Breeding, Bleeding Disorders Registry. And we've had uh, a few uh, hemophilia treatment centers in a number of countries that now understand the, the value of joining the World Breeding Disorders Registry. 
So we would be happy uh, to take that discussion further forward in Palestine. We've started it already, and we would be uh, happy to take it further forward uh, to, and also to assist, to provide uh, actual assistance to the Ministry of Health and the Hemophilia Treatment Centers on how to go about this. And the problem is, uh, as David said, the, the expense, um, but uh, it, is, it is extremely important. It's the very first step. We cannot stress it enough, and we will be using all the resources at our disposal to help countries that are interested in uh, taking uh, that uh, kind of work further forward. Thank you. Thank you, Rolanda. If we have no uh, more questions, uh, I'd like to very much to thank uh, uh, all uh, the speakers, uh, David, uh, Brian, Solange, uh, Masoud, uh, all the people from the WFH who worked relentlessly to have this successful webinar, uh, Rana and the team uh, from the WFH. And uh, finally, also to thank very much all the attendees who uh, actively contributed in the uh, discussion uh, of this webinar. And uh, so I thank you all uh, and uh, hope to see you in other uh, successful webinars. Thank you, Dr. Magdi. Just a word of thanks to Ingrid and Felipe who are behind the scenes but have done a wonderful job to make sure this all runs smoothly. Thank you.